Hey, it's Dougie Wood, and in this video, I'm going to explain to you exactly what is SharePoint. So we're going to be talking about SharePoint from a few different angles, about it being used for in an intranet, for collaboration and document management, as well as stick around to the end for my top tip or a lesser known feature of how SharePoint is also used. Before we jump into that and start looking at some different examples, I'm going to first talk about what is SharePoint. So SharePoint is a product of Microsoft 365. Now there are other SharePoint versions which are referred to as on-premise versions. Now if you're not too sure which version of SharePoint it is that you're using, I do have a separate video um, which is called what type of SharePoint am I using? So go check that out because there's a few different things that will help work through to figure out what type of SharePoint you're actually using. But for this video, I'm going to be talking about SharePoint Online. Now, SharePoint Online um, is probably one of the most commonly used SharePoints now, and it's part of Microsoft 365. It's a single product. So if you think about Microsoft 365 as a collection of products, depending on the license, it's probably somewhere between 20 to 30 different products. And SharePoint is just one of those particular products. There's a number of different ways you can get access to SharePoint, but it's most likely somebody sent you a link internally. You can also get access to it by going to office.com and using the search bar across the top to look for SharePoint or open the app launcher across the top left hand side and then click on SharePoint here. And that will then get you into the SharePoint navigation bar. Now, this is almost like the SharePoint kind of search page is the best way to describe it. It's not actually like your intranet homepage. So a lot of people often get mistaken and they come here thinking, oh, this is the intranet homepage. They've clicked on SharePoint. They've heard their intranet is, is powered by SharePoint. So they come here and think that's it. It's not, this is more of a kind of like searching for SharePoint related content. So you do have a search bar across the top. You've also got your um, kind of following the sites that you kind of follow here. This is almost like a bookmarking tool. You've also got the recent sites you've recently accessed. So say, for example, you've been moving between a lot of different sites within inside of your SharePoint um, intranet, and you're trying to find where it was that you were, and you can think, oh, okay, well, I was on human resources site before. I'll click on that and go back to that. So this is more of a kind of navigational page more than anything else, and it'll help you find your content. Because to, to talk a little bit, I mean, we'll talk a bit more about intranets later in this video, but just to set the scene, SharePoint isn't just one site. Think of it as like a collection of mini websites which all form together to form an intranet. And you might have access to some areas and not access to others. But this search page will only ever surface things to you which you do have access to. So you're never going to find access to something that you shouldn't have access to, like a board of directors SharePoint site or something like that, unless you have been intentionally added to that SharePoint site. So there's two main things that SharePoint is known for. One is document management, and we'll come on to talking about that later on. And the second is the use of it as a intranet. Now, I often like to refer to this as a single source of truth, meaning that this is should be one platform where you can go and find all the information that you need access to. So this might be a, an example of what an intranet homepage would look like. Essentially, your intranet homepage should have a couple of different features, really. The first is it's about providing information to people. It's about communication and giving out things like news articles, announcements, latest updates from senior people inside of your organization. And that can be shown in a couple of different ways. So we could maybe show it as a slideshow to allow people to flick through. We could also display it as a news feed and show news feeds being rolled up here. And you can see that these actually are being pulled from what we call a department site. So you can see we've got different SharePoint sites. And this goes back to what I was saying before, that SharePoint isn't just one site. It's a collection of different sites. So you might have a human resources site or a marketing site, an IT site, different sites for different departments. And essentially their sites are a way of communicating and publishing content to the wider organization. So it might be news articles, it might be um, key documents, templates, things like that that they need to share with their wider organization. We can also see things like events. And again, these could roll up potentially from department sites as well if you wanted to. 
Um, the cool thing I like about these events is that you can also choose to add them into your own calendar. So it's like a little reminder that something's coming up, whether it be a training, webinar, or a company get together, or a party, or something like that. We can add those easily to our own calendar. Now, this internet homepage is often what they refer to as a hub site. Now, a hub site is almost like, think of it as like the center of your intranet. Then all these other sites, like your department sites, are kind of like satellite sites which link to this hub site. So the hub site is almost like the top of the Christmas tree to a certain extent. And things like the navigation bar across the top is set at the hub site level. And then the other sites, like the department sites, will then inherit that navigation bar and you'll easily then be able to find your way around the different sites. It can have up to three layers deep. So you can see under knowledge base, we've got finance and then expense request, for example. It will also allow you to set the branding at the hub site level. So we've got this nice kind of light blue, purple kind of theme going on to match the Microsoft 365 logo. And that's then inherited by all of our kind of department sites, um, which then brands those sites up as well. Now, you might have heard the term about subsites. And now this is something which is a old school way of thinking of SharePoint. And it's actually the true subsites have actually been decommissioned and you shouldn't be using them anymore. If you have any sort of questions or you're not too sure about subsites, again, I do have another video. Um, I think it's called Do Not Use SharePoint Subsites or something like that. So go and check that out on my channel and that will explain it in a lot more detail. The difference between why classically SharePoint was using subsites and now it's using um, what we refer, refer to as communication sites, which are linked to a hub site. Just whilst we're on the topic of internet homepages, I thought I'd show you another example. Um, and you can see up here that the name of this is different. So this is called One Place because I thought that was quite a nice name um, for a intranet. You've, I've also seen other names as well, things like The Landing or Lighthouse, um, all these sort of names. Essentially, you can give your intranet whatever name you want. Um, and quite often, it's a good way of actually getting adoption in the early days of rolling out an intranet is to survey and poll your audience, the end user, say, well, what would you like to call your intranet? And actually, that will then get them on board and um, buy into it at an early stage. So it might be that you come up with a few ideas first and then say, which one do you like best? So I quite like this name. I saw one of my clients using One Place. I thought that was quite a cool name. Um, because it essentially goes back to this idea of a single source of truth where everything can be found in one place. So all of your forms, all of your templates, things like that. Um, so you can see, again, we've got this sort of news slideshow going on here. We've got a countdown timer on the right-hand side. We have got news, and they've actually broken out into a couple of different types of news. So we've got from your department. So this would be perfect for a very large or maybe enterprise sort of level organization where you've got multiple department sites publishing different types of news from like IT department, human resources, things like that, and we're rolling it up. Now, you can also use what they call audience targeting in SharePoint. So you can show and hide content dependent on a group that you're part of, whether that be a department or maybe it's even a country. So you can see here, I'm in the United Kingdom. So this country related news is then filtering and showing me news specifically related to the United Kingdom, the UK, rather than saying, for example, uh, if I had colleagues in the US, then they might see um, US related news as just an example. Um, so we've got more kind of news feeds here. We can roll up things like videos. We can embed things like um, Twitter or um, sort of Yammer feeds and things like that into here as well, just for that social media kind of feel. Some large tiles. So again, this kind of second purpose of a uh, intranet was that, well, the first one was about communication um, and, and providing that kind of piece of what's the latest kind of articles, what's the latest news, things like that. And the second thing is navigation. So helping people find things. And you'll find in SharePoint, there's multiple different places that you can find navigational feeds um, and you can find them across the top, but you can also find quick links and you can find sort of tiles like this, which is made up of image web parts. Um, you might see roll-ups, so recommendations or feeding up documents from specific areas of the internet. Frequently asked uh, access sites, recent documents, all that sort of good stuff. It's all navigational. So it's all helping you find content that you want to find easily. I briefly then spoke about department sites as well. So if you imagine then 
if we were to click through from our internet homepage to one of these department sites, we could get to a department site like this for human resources. Now, the purpose of a department site is to be able to communicate to the wider organization certain information or files. So this isn't an area necessarily of collaboration, a space where people are constantly working and evolving documents. It's a publishing platform. And in fact, nowadays, these sites are called communication SharePoint sites because they're communicating things. Previously, they were referred to as publishing sites, which I actually quite like. And call me a bit old school, but I think that summarizes it quite well because you're publishing content to the wider organization, to the wider audience um, of, your, of your business or your organization. And say, for example, for human resources, it might be that you're looking to do, you're looking for your human resources department to survey the wider kind of organization um, and, the, and the employees. So it might be that you want to bounce them into an employee poll. It might be um, that you're going through a very large recruitment drive currently, and you want to make sure that your managers have got an area that they can find out the best top tips for interviewing people during that recruitment drive. And in fact, actually, something else which has been quite common recently, going back to that thought of an audience targeting so we can show and hide content or navigational links dependent on what group you're part of, we could also create an area called, say, Manager's Toolbox or Manager's Toolkit, for example, and that only shows to people who are managers, and then that could have more resources inside of there, things that ne not necessarily you'd want all employees to have access to, so things like... Um, information on disciplinary procedures or how to onboard staff or any of those different things that managers would need to know but end kind of employees um, wouldn't necessarily need to, to need to know. You can also see quick links here so about sort of maybe questions we all got about tax or leave requests or um, any of these different things. Um, it might be linking out to key information about compensation or benefits more kind of topics which people are asking about, um, holidays, so different holidays in different regions of the world and what dates they fall on, um, who to contact, so these might be contacts um, um, or linking out to a contact form if you've got a question. Again, some more news announcements, celebrations, recent documents which have been uploaded into the intranet. So that's just another example of how SharePoint is being used. But this is a SharePoint site dedicated to the human resources for publishing content and providing almost like a self-service portal where employees can go to kind of get that information rather than reaching out directly to the human resources department first. It's a kind of filtering, a triaging approach that you can bounce people into to say, okay, go and check um, whatever your internet's called, whether it be the hub or one place, go and check our human resources site on one place. Can you find the information there before you reach out to our department? The next thing that SharePoint provides is collaboration. Now, by collaboration, what I mean is that multiple people can work together using this as a tool to streamline their efficiency, using it for collaborating on documents or sharing information with their team. So this is often comes in the form of what they call a SharePoint team site. Now, all of the SharePoint sites we've just been looking at are referred to as communication sites, which are, again, about more of a publishing platform. It's providing information to a wider audience. Whereas the team sites I'm going to now show you are essentially for just a specific team to be working together. So here's an example. This is a project management team. Now you can already see that team site looks different to a communication site in the sense that we have got this navigation bar on the left-hand side that's pushing out. So rather than the navigation bar being across the top, it's on the left-hand side. Now you tend to find with team sites, they are a little bit more minimalistic, they're a little bit more streamlined, they don't have as much content on them because they're not for a huge amount of communication and sort of publishing. They're more about providing an area for people to work together, to store documents, to track with lists, um, task lists, things like that, um, or bounce off into Microsoft Teams for communication. So you can see here this, this project management team, we've got, these are just some sample content, so maybe it's linking off to a progress tracker, which could be a SharePoint list. Same with issue tracker, could be a SharePoint list, or it could bounce you off into maybe a project management tool um, or a, whatever it is that you're kind of using for tracking your, your projects. It might be that we're trying to show a countdown to a particular product or project launch date, 
some key milestones in here, um, links out to key useful tools which you might be using for that particular project, contacts for the projects, um, as well as useful documents and activity of what's been going on that SharePoint site. There could also be some news which is generated from here, but you don't tend to see a lot of that being used by, the, by this particular team site. Now, team sites are a little bit kind of like uh, Marmite to a certain extent. People either love them or hate them. You tend to find people either all in the kind of SharePoint world or they're going to a more, what I think is more of a modern kind of approach, which is a Microsoft Teams approach. Because in Microsoft Teams, where you've got your kind of chat functions and things like that, every Microsoft team also has a corresponding SharePoint team site in the background. I know that gets a little bit confusing, but try and stay with me. Um, so all of the files which are generated from a Microsoft team in that kind of chat world is automatically stored inside of SharePoint. So you tend to find that a lot of the collaboration nowadays goes on inside the Microsoft team because people are talking with each other, sharing files with each other, and it's automatically being stored inside of SharePoint. And inside of a team, you might know you, you've got that files tab across the top. You can click on that and you can open the files from there. So you tend to find people have a, a bit of an approach where they either are already kind of used to using SharePoint, so they use SharePoint as their kind of collaborational tool, or they use Microsoft Teams, and without realizing that you, they're using SharePoint just to store the files in the background. But I just wanted to show you a bit of an example because there are people that do use SharePoint still for team collaboration within here. Um, and we'll come on to talk about document management of files for, for Teams and other types of scenarios in a moment. So the most commonly known use of SharePoint is about document management. So using it to not only store documents, but also work on them and collaborate with them with your team members. Now you can use SharePoint, whether it be communication sites that we were looking at earlier on, or team sites to use uh, for storing documents and working on them together. Um, in fact, actually the features are exactly the same. There's no difference between a communication site or a team site when it comes to using documents. Every single SharePoint site has what we refer to as a document library, which is stored on it. Now you can create more document libraries, but it's very rare that you actually need to do that. One document library can store quite a lot of different documents in there, but there are some rough kind of thresholds eventually that you will hit. Um, so use as a rule of thumb, we kind of talk in the SharePoint world of around 5,000 documents being kind of the amount of documents that you would want to surface at one time inside of what we call a view. So let's dive in and take a little look at what we mean by that. So you can see here on the left hand side, I've got a link called documents, and that will get me to the document library, which is created on this site. If for whatever reason, you can't see a link to your documents, you can also get to it by clicking on the cog across the top clicking on site contents, and then you can see all the contents in the back end of that particular SharePoint site. You can see we've got this document library here. So I'm gonna click on documents, and that's the default document library for my SharePoint. Now, you can see across the top, we've got the ability to create new, we've got upload, and we've got a couple of different options as well that I'll explain as we go through. We've got the new button, which is where we can create brand new folders and files. So if I click on folder, you can see I can give it a name. So maybe let's just say, this is our folder one. I can also color code them now as well. So maybe I want to go with the purple with this one, create folder one, create a couple more folders. So we'll create folder two, and this one's gonna be red. And then one more, we'll create folder three. And there we go, we've got a sort of lighter purplish pinkish color. So we've got folder one, two, and three in here. Now you can also click into them to create subfolders. Again, by clicking on new and then folder, say folder 1.1, for example, click on green, and we can click on it again. I'll create one more folder called folder 1.2. Just to give you an example here, you can see as we're kind of drilling in here, we can see this area here is referred to as the breadcrumb navigation. The reason being is, you can see this is how we got to folder 1.2 was from folder one, and inside of folder one, we went to folder 1.1, and then inside of that, we went to folder 1.2. And it's called a breadcrumb because you can click on this and you can navigate back up the kind of chain. So you can navigate back to the very top of the folder structure um, without having to sort of, sort of click around all too much. 
So that's how we create folders. Now within those folders, we can create brand new files by click on new. And then we've got this option here to create Word documents, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, um, and a few other different types in here. So I'm gonna create a, a Word document just by clicking on Word. That's gonna create me a brand new document. Now you can see it will just give it a default name to start with. It will just call it document. So if I wanted to change that and click on the little drop down here, and maybe I call this Dougie's document. Then within this little page, I'm gonna put a bit of text. This is some text. And one thing you'll notice is I'm actually working currently inside of the browser. So it's automatically opened it in Word Online. And everything I do is constantly being saved. And you can see that little symbol up here um, is showing that it's constantly being saved. Now the benefits of that is it means that if say for example my internet suddenly went or my laptop battery went or something like that, it's constantly saved from the very last character that I typed into the document. Now sometimes that startles people a little bit and they get a little bit worried because they think, well, what if I make a change? I didn't want to save it. Well, the the reason that, that, that this is the case, I say, is to, is to prevent something from happening. So it's constantly saving. So to mitigate the kind of issue of what happens if you're saving something you didn't want to, is you've also got this option here called version history. So if you click on this drop down, click on version history, you can see all the different changes which have been made to the documents. You can see, obviously this isn't a great example because I've literally just created this document. But imagine this document's been going for a few weeks. You can have loads of different versions in here. So you can compare the difference between the document when it's first created and where it is currently now and everything that happened in between. Then you can always go back and choose to either save a copy so you can go, okay, I realize there's been a mistake in the document or something's changed. I actually, I'm either going to restore it back to how it originally was or I'm going to save a copy and start a brand new one. And if you were collaborating with somebody, you might choose the save a copy option because you're not too sure you need to kind of speak to that person. You don't want to override their kind of changes. But the cool thing about version history is even if you were to sort of like restore it or, or change the document again, and then somebody rang you up and said, hey, Dougie, you shouldn't have done that. That was intentionally like that. You can always go back and change it from a previous version. Nothing gets lost, everything is saved, and it's nice and easy to work with. We can also choose um, where we're kind of editing this document. If I wanted to, I could choose to open the, the uh, Word document directly in the Word desktop app if I wanted to. And now this is just preference. In, in reality, using it inside of a browser, inside of Word Online, is basically the same as using it in the Word desktop. There's not a huge amount of difference for the kind of average user. I think it just mostly comes down to preference. It looks a little bit different and feels a little bit different. Me personally, again, I don't know if it's just because of years of using the Word um, app, but I choose, if I'm building a document from scratch, I tend to create a new document, click on open desktop app, and then use the Word app on my computer to, to build out the document. Whereas if I was just reviewing a document, so someone was sent something to me and said, hey Dougie, can you check this out? Add some comments to it or something like that. I would be more than comfortable. I would always do it in the kind of the, the Word Online version that the default opens up to. So as I say, you can do everything you'd normally do in a Word document, um, inserting comments and um, all those bits and bobs, changing styles and formats and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's basically the, the, the same, but there's just some subtle differences. So I would suggest use both, try both, see what works for you, um, and then take it from there. So um, to get out of this document, I can just click on to close the tab, um, and there you go, you can see my, my Dougie's document is there. Um, again, you can do the same. I'm not gonna bore you by going through Excel and PowerPoint and stuff, but it works all in exactly the same way. The only other one I did want to mention here was the link. Um, because this essentially allows you to create a hyperlink but store it alongside of your documents as if it was a real document or um, say for example uh, one of these documents here these documents do not live inside of this document library so this is a great way of linking to a, another document that lives elsewhere so let's say for example you've got one document but um, it could potentially live in two places let's say for example you've got a working from home policy now um, some people, they as part of their internet, their single source of truth, they create a dedicated area just for policies. So they store it there. However, everybody finds documents differently. The way I find a document might be completely different to the way that you find the document. So say, for example, I know there's a policies library on my internet. I will navigate to that 
click on it and then find that that particular working from home policy. Whereas you might not know that policy library even exists and you might be thinking, oh, policies, surely it lives on the human resources site. So you go to the human resources site and look for it. So there's potentially two places that that document could live. And the last thing you ever want to do, and if you ever come across this, then <laughs> you really need to warn them. Do not duplicate documents. Do not have a document that lives in one place and lives a separate version of it into another place because you're only asking for trouble in this scenario because what will end up happening is somebody will say oh well hang on well that's not in that version of the policy i've got or whatever it is or they turn up to a meeting with an old version of a document something like that you want to prevent that so in this case what we could do is say for example um uh, we've got our, our kind of policy or our information our, our kind of life insurance i could select that and then use that as a link now you can see this gives me a little symbol here to show that it's a link to a document. It's not the actual original document. But say, for example, this was on my human resources site. I could be linking out to that policy, just going into that scenario that we are talking about before. And I can jump directly to that policy rather than actually having a duplicate version of the document. The other cool reason of why you have links as well, say, for example, under project management, say we're working on a particular project, project one, um, and we're getting quotes from different customer, sorry, different partners, different suppliers, things like that. Or we're doing some research. And we found a really cool link or something. Um, we can paste that link into here. And then we've got that link. We can name it if we wanted to. But then you've got that link. So all you need to do is then click on that link and it automatically opens up in a separate tab, uh, whatever it was. So it's a good place of storing things together. So quite often when you're creating a project folder, there's a combination of files, but there's also a lot of links shared knowledge and resources and things like that, which you want to store alongside that um, product uh, or that project as well. We can also upload. So we can upload loads of files and folders directly from in here. Um, we've also got the ability uh, to sync um, so we can access these documents offline. Um, and we can also automate um, a lot of the, the kind of processes like things like um, setting up reminders or setting up approval processes and that's integrating Power Automate directly into our documents. That was just a whistle stop tour about document management inside of SharePoint. If this is something of interest and you want to see more of this type of content, do let me know. Use the comments feed below to let me know if you've got any questions or any scenarios that you'd like to see or if you just want some general more information, I can create some more content about document management as well. But I want to ask a favour. I would like you to subscribe to my channel because it really does help my channel grow and expand and reach new people. Something else you might be interested in is I also have a membership option of my YouTube channel. Now this is only 99p a month, so it's a real bargain and you're not gonna find any other kind of high quality training like this from a leading industry specialist um, like myself, not to blow my own trumpet, um, but as I say, if you're interested in kind of learning more about SharePoint, the membership of this um, will unlock some members only content. So this um, unlocks a SharePoint training program, which will go into much more detail about SharePoint document management through libraries, advanced features, setting up navigation, engaging with SharePoint intranets and making really cool content, as well as understanding how SharePoint search works for uh, an intranet. We also have a, a set of members videos which will also go into how to build from scratch a cool SharePoint intranet like you've seen in the examples today, as well as the SharePoint department site step by step and you can follow along with me. There's also some members Q&A areas, so we've got some questions from our members in there um, and as the kind of channel grows, I'm not going to get the chance to always answer all the questions and the comments on my uh, videos, but we do have this dedicated members only Q&A area, so you can ask any questions um, and I can answer them there as a priority. There's also a little area here where I'm also constantly asking for people's feedback on what types of training courses you'd like to see, whether it be related to SharePoint or Microsoft 365, or there's quite a lot of demand at the moment for some Power Automate for beginners type of training as well. So um, a lot of that will be coming out shortly and it'll be coming out to the members only. So go and check out the membership um, for my channel and that'll get you access to some really useful um, sort of behind the scenes type of content. And as always, if you have any questions at all, you can put them in the comments feed below. I do my best to, to 
um, answer th those questions and like the video. Um, uh, and if there's anybody that you would think would be, find this useful, again, you can always share this with them. The next feature of kind of SharePoint is the security benefits that it brings. Now, SharePoint allows you to control who has access to different areas of SharePoint. So this might be, say, for example, um, completely hiding something. So saying this area is only for managers only, for example, and hiding it completely to people who are not part of the managers group. Or it could be kind of changing what level of access you have to something. So let's say, for example, that human resources site that we're looking at. Now, we want everyone to be able to read and download content from that site, but we don't want everyone to have to edit it. We only want a handful of selected users from our human resources department to be able to edit things. Now, this is all controlled via what we call SharePoint permissions. SharePoint permissions can be accessed by clicking the cog across the top, then click on site permissions, and then we can see we've got three different groups. We've got what we call site owners, which means they have full control. They have access to do everything. We've got site members with limited control, um, which means that they maybe have access to create new content, but they can't necessarily share um, the site to the same level as a full control user. And then we've got site visitors who have no control, but they just have read access. Now you can individually add people, like I've added myself in here. You could also choose to add in a security group um, like an Azure AD security group into here. Um, you can also choose to use some of the standard out of the box groups that SharePoint creates. For example, like everyone except external users will add in everybody who is licensed for SharePoint inside of your kind of Microsoft 365 world into this particular site. So it means it automatically will give them access. So this is what we call permissions. Now I do have a dedicated video for SharePoint permissions. If you want to go into a bit more detail about uh, about how permissions work and how to grant them the different levels, because that can get very confusing very quickly. So go and check out that video and it will explain it much better for you about how you can um, give people access and what the different levels of access mean. Something else which, I mean, fundamentally, it's in the name of the product of SharePoint. The whole purpose of SharePoint is to share content with people. So sharing is really important when it comes to SharePoint um, because essentially that's what you're doing. You're creating content that you want to easily share with people. So going back to my example of my documents here, if I select on a document, I've got this share option. Now the share options will then allow me to say who I want to share this with and even give them a little message. I could then click on send and that will then automatically send an email to them with that message or I can click on copy link and I can then share that with other people. Now there are different levels of sharing. Um, so if I click on that little cog across the top, you can see there's four different kind of um, levels that we can do. The first one is what we call anyone. Now this literally means um, anyone in the world and by default that will be grayed out so you can see here it says your organization is preventing you from selecting this option so by by default it's turned off you have to enable it and you have to then apply it to which sharepoint sites you want to allow for external sharing um, now this feature is really useful specifically for replacing things like dropbox or other kind of third party kind of areas that you might be using to share documents with external parties um, you could also say share with people um, inside, inside of the organization uh, with an account required. So this basically means we could share this with anyone. This, this is just the name of my kind of, uh, my, my kind of tenant area. Um, so we could say anybody inside your organization. So say, for example, your organization is called uh, Contoso. It would be people in Contoso have access with this link. Or you can say people with existing access. So because this is in the project management team and there's four members, if I select this link, it means that only the four people that are already specified in the permissions of the SharePoint site would have access. Or I can say people that I specifically choose. And this is where we get a couple of extra options. So it might be that I want them um, to edit the document so I can choose to say I want to make any changes. I can allow them to review it, which means they can only suggest changes. Or I can say they can um, 
view only, which means they can't make any changes at all. And if that's the case, I can also choose to turn on um, a, a sort of block download option as well. So that literally means they can only open the document, they can read it, they can see it, and they can sort of consume the information, but they can't edit it, they can't delete it, and they can't even download it at that point. Then once we click on apply, again, we get back to this box where I can type in someone's name or I can click on copy link, and that link, either if it's sent by email or if I use it as a copy link and paste it into a chat, the link will work exactly the same. So fundamentally, sharing is a really important feature of SharePoint and how that works so that you can actually collaborate with people, share content and get their input. The final top tip, so if you've stuck around in this video until now, thank you very much. But the final top tip, not everyone's aware of inside of SharePoint, is that you can also have external sharing. Now, I don't just mean um, sharing documents, but actually sharing a whole SharePoint site. So you could create a SharePoint site called, say, suppliers or contractors or customers or whatever you wanted to call, and you can invite them into your SharePoint site. Um, now, this means that you can have that collaborational feature going outside of your organization. So you could create a little portal where you're sharing announcements and news and uh, things like that. Or it could be like a little drop-off area. So it could be that you're asking for people to drop off documents um, that you can then sort of collect. So that's really useful for um, things like uh, getting, as I say, getting rid of things like Dropbox and things like that. Or um, actually, I was working with an organization last year which um, was still requiring um, their customers to send them very large amounts of data, which up until recently they were doing by sending CD-ROMs in the post. Um, whereas instead, using SharePoint, we managed to build a system where that it could automatically send out an email with a link say, hey, click on this link, it's shared from SharePoint. Instead of sending as a CD, put instead all the files into the SharePoint folder and that triggered a notification to the staff internally that the files had been accepted and brought in. And that saved loads of time. And also it saved loads of, sort of issues of um, CD-ROMs sort of failing or not working properly or getting lost in the post and all that sort of stuff, it made their lives so much easier. So actually think about SharePoint external use, not just about kind of file sharing and sort of, sort of sharing a document um, outside the organization, but also think of it as like a platform, a portal that you can bring people into, sharing information, drop-off areas, collection areas. It might be that you've got a customer portal and you're putting in their monthly kind of reports in there for them so they can go in and find those files themselves rather than sending out hundreds of emails every month and things like that. So SharePoint can be used for that as well. So that's the end of this video. As I say, if you enjoyed it, please do like, subscribe to the channel. Consider also the membership options because that will really fast track your learning about understanding Microsoft SharePoint and all the different kind of features of it. Not only is it going through all those different features inside of the training videos, but we also have, again, the kind of how to build an intranet step by step along with me. Um, and there is the, the members Q&A area for any questions you have going through that kind of process. I hope you enjoyed the video and keep an eye out for uh, future videos to be released. Thank you.